Hello and welcome to episode number 15 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast. 15 episodes. Wow, we are just chugging right along here with Cheese Steaks and Controllers. My name is Jason Finelli and I am the esports and gaming insider for Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM Philadelphia, 1480 AM Philadelphia, and I Heart. Radio, and we have quite a show for you this week, my friends. A lot of things happening, a lot of moving and shaking in the industry this week. One big time purchase, which we will get into. Um, League of Legends World Championship starts this week, so I'm going to give you a little bit, one more little primer on that, uh, specifically on the teams in the North America region, so we can all talk about those. And uh, so much more. So let's not waste any more time and get right into the six in 60 seconds. Riot Games has announced the first tournament in Valorant, hosted by the developer themselves, called Valorant First Strike. Meanwhile, the 2020 Hearthstone World Championships are scheduled for December, with eight players from across the world competing for a $500,000 prize pool. Also, Nerd Street Gamers has announced the 2021 Winter Championships, four game tournaments totaling over $100,000 in prize money. Microsoft has purchased Bethesda for $7.5 billion, bringing Bethesda's entire portfolio, including The Elder Scrolls, Fallout, and more, to Microsoft and Xbox. Meanwhile, more Tekken 7 Season 4 and Street Fighter V Season 5 details coming this weekend during the Tokyo Game Show online event. And finally, the Game Awards 2020, hosted by Jeff Keighley, are set for December 10th, and we'll go live in three cities, Los Angeles, London, and Tokyo. That is your six in 60 seconds. There they are. That is the six in 60 seconds. That Microsoft Bethesda deal. Oh boy, did that start the week off right. Uh, Monday morning, 9 a.m., dropping that news on top of all of us. And things just kept rolling from there this week. It was quite a week for games. And uh, Microsoft and Bethesda just kicked us off. I'll talk about that a little bit later on want to go into a bit of more detail about that, what it entails, and what it means, or could mean, uh, for the industry at large. But before we do that, I would like to talk once more about League of Legends Worlds 2020, the League of Legends major playoff uh, of the year, are happening starting today, 925, if you're listening when the uh, podcast is uploaded to iHeartRadio, or yesterday, if you're listening on the radio itself on Saturday uh, with the play-in format, which is uh, 10 teams cut into two groups of five. They play each other once, and then eventually four of the teams in this will qualify for the main event. Um, With this starting uh, on the 25th of September, I thought it would be a good idea to do a little explainer introduction to the three North American-based teams that you will be cheering for as a new North American League of Legends viewer um, during the tournament. I will go over all three teams, how long they've been around, uh, the organizations themselves, and the individual players on the respective teams. And we will start with the team in the play-in game, uh, ranked number three in the League Championship Series, which is the North American division of League of Legends um, format. And that is Team... Liquid. Team Liquid, a uh, very iconic logo with a picture of a horse. Almost looks like the um, the knight piece on a chessboard uh, with a nice shield. Almost like a coat of arms looking logo. Very, very cool. Uh, this is actually, uh, technically the company is based in the Netherlands, but they are one of the biggest North American esports organizations that there is. Founded all the way back in 2000. And the first ever game they signed players for was, of all things, StarCraft II Wings of Liberty. So you know, just by hearing that, this team has been around forever. They currently have uh, rosters for games like Apex Legends, Clash Royale, Clash Royale, excuse me, uh, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Dota 2, Fortnite, League of Legends, Hearthstone, um, Street Fighter, StarCraft 2 was their first game, Super Smash Bros. Melee, and Ultimate Tekken, and the list just goes on and on and on. Um, They are easily one of the biggest esports organizations that there is. Um, It was founded just as Liquid back in 2000, and then uh, eventually they started adding more teams and adding more players. They called themselves Team Liquid. 
Uh, but as far as League of Legends specifically is concerned, uh, they are the number three team in the LCS, which means they have made the play-in stage. Uh, they will be going against nine other teams uh, in two groups of five, hoping to get out of there and get themselves into the main event. And the players that you will be uh, cheering for if you decide to back um, Team Liquid in these Worlds 2020, there are uh, six players, two from Korea, two from Denmark, one from Canada, and one from Nor- uh, USA. So first we have Impact uh, from Korea. He is a top laner and one of the best players in the league. Uh, you have Broxa, Mads Brox Peterson. He is a jungler. Uh, a jungler in League of Legends stays out of the lanes and instead deals with the areas in between each lane, killing um, random monsters and gaining resources that way. That's Brox's uh, role. You have Jensen, Nikolaj Jensen, uh, in the mid lane. You have Edward Ra, tactical, in the bottom lane or the bot laner. Uh, you have one support player in uh, Core JJ. Uh, he's the Korean. He's the second Korean player. And then finally, the Canadian TF Blade, whose name is Ashkin Homanyuni. He is a sub slash top laner. Now, all of these players are new to uh, Team Liquid. They uh, the most the the, late, the earliest signing of the six uh, were Core JJ and Jensen signed in November. Uh, 2018 and Impact in November 2017. So they've had a couple years to get uh, to know each other and to gel. Um, all four of the six players are in a contract year with their contracts ending uh, in November of 2020. The other two uh, have contracts till 2021 and 2022. They're a, they're, they're a young team, but they um, definitely have their work cut out for them uh, in this play-in Format. I believe they are in an, a the group of worlds playing with a team called Mad Lions out of the Chinese League, and they are a very very tough draw. Um, not one that the uh, not one that the team Liquid really uh, should be looking. I'm sorry, in the European League, the Mad Lions, not the Chinese League. LDG is uh, LGD. Excuse me, is in China. I'm still learning all this League of Legends stuff. I just recently dove into it, wrapped my head in it, and we are going to learn together because I am still learning as well. Uh, so yes, the group stage round one is uh, Team Liquid, Supermassive Esports, who is also tough, uh, out of Turkey, Mad Lions in the EU, Legacy Esports in the Oceanic, and Brazilians INTZ. Um, honestly, I don't know if I like Team Liquid's chances to get out of the play-in. Um, I am very much in the camp of Supermassive in that group, uh, with Mad Lions right behind them. Uh, Supermassive dominates in Turkey, uh, number one in the Turkish uh, market with a bullet. They're very, very tough to play, um, and this play-in round is definitely going to let them showcase their abilities. Uh, in Group B, there are no North American teams, so we'll hold off on that for now and not have to worry about it until it's time. But yeah, Team Liquid, uh, number three, playing in the play-in. Uh, I look, I have a lot of faith in Broxa. I have a lot of faith in uh, Core JJ and Impact to do well. Um, tactical in the bottom lane. I really think this team can win at least one or two uh, to get into that third or fourth spot where they have a chance to play to get it, uh, one of the two final matches of the play-in round to get into the main event. But I really do think they're going to get cut off eventually, whether it's by Mad Lions or Supermassive, whichever one of those two does not qualify by being first in the group. Um, they're just tough. They're just very tough to play, very tough to beat, and I would not be surprised if Team Liquid bows out in the play-ins. Not that that's anything to shake a stick at or, or, or tear up your nose at. You still made the world championships of League of Legends. That is not something to um, to ignore, something to be very, very proud of, and I hope that this team does do, does go well, does do well for the North Americans. Um, but now on to the second-seeded North American team. This team is already in the um, main event, and they are in group letter D um, with a couple of, if you want to talk about bad draws, FlyQuest is really in a tough draw here uh, in this in this main event. Uh, they really have drawn a tough, 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 tough 
uh, division with DRX out of Korea and um, Top Esports out of China, two of the best teams in the league, uh, if not the world right now, uh, waiting to play them. And then the Group D team that they would get would be something like a Mad Lions or something like that. So either way, FlyQuest definitely has their work cut out for them, which is kind of unfair. FlyQuest, of the three teams that have made it from North America, is the youngest. They've only been around since 2017. And the only reason they exist, to be quite honest, is an interesting story. So, per FlyQuest's Wikipedia page, I'm just going to read this little blurb right off the Wikipedia page so I don't get it wrong. FlyQuest was originally founded after the acquisition of the League of Legends roster of Cloud9 Challenger, the sister team of the well-known Cloud9 organization. Cloud9 Challenger qualified for the League Championship Series in August 2016 alongside Cloud9, but LCS rules forbid one organization from having multiple teams in the same league. So the team was sold to its current owners, rebranded to FlyQuest, the roster did not change, and now FlyQuest holds its own with the rest of the uh, teams in the North America as its own thing. It grew out of the shadow of Cloud9, one of the most storied League of Legends teams in the world, uh, and they have been playing well ever since, earning the uh, runner-up spot in the LCS Summer Finals, losing to Team Solo Mid, who we'll get to, and being the second-ranked team from the North American region in Worlds 2020. So they have um, an American, a Dane, a German, two Canadians, and a Korean uh, on their team. First, we have Solo, Uh, who is the top laner, Santorin, who is the jungler, Power of Evil, which is a fantastic name, in the mid lane, Uh, two bot laners, uh, bottom laners, in Mash and Wild Turtle, and Ignar is their support. Um, As I said before, this team has played well all year in the LCS, really has uh, done the North American uh, division proud, has been very entertaining to watch, um, and I just, I just don't know if they're going to get out of their group. Their group is so tough. If you look up those teams they're playing, top esports is, is is a buzzsaw, and DRX is right behind them. DRX, if you remember, is who Julian Pastry Time Car picked to win the whole thing last week uh, when he was speaking to me on this podcast. So that's the kind of power that FlyQuest is up against here. And really, I want to say that I think they can do it, but those two teams alone, and not even including whoever the play-in team is in their group, it's a lot to overcome, and I'm not confident they're going to do it. So congratulations, FlyQuest, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the luck of the group's draw, the group draw was just not with you, and um, I hope to be wrong here. I hope you can prove me wrong. I really do. I want to be wrong. I want to be cheering you in the knockout stage. Um, feel free to tell me that I'm wrong by uh, blowing through all of these other teams in your group. But uh, the number one team in North America, the team that I have a lot of confidence in, is Team Solo Mid. Team Solo Mid, also known to esports fans as TSM, one of the most prolific esports teams there is uh, with a team or a player represented in 11 or sorry a dozen different games going anywhere from League of Legends like we're talking about now to Super Smash Brothers to Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six to Fortnite to chess yes actual board game chess they sponsor a player who plays chess uh, that player's name, in case you're wondering, is Hikaru Nakamura. He's an American uh, with the ID GM Hikaru, and he only joined in August of this year. So it's a new addition to Team Solo Mid, but they do sponsor a player who plays chess. I find that to be wonderful, and I feel like more teams should sponsor chess players so we can have a major chess league, because chess is fun and interesting to watch. But that's just me. Uh, we're talking about League of Legends here, and, and there, there's League of Legends team in particular is one of the most historic teams to ever play the game uh, in its 10-year history. They have been in the finals or near the finals every season 
in North America. In fact, they are the only team to qualify for the first seven world championships every single year for the first seven years, and all of the North American League's finals. All ten. All the first ten uh, League Championship Series finals in North America has had Team Solo Mid in some form or fashion. This is the Yankees of North American League of Legends. This is the team that is always in there every single year, kicking butt and taking names. And right now, once again, they are number one in North America and currently sitting in Group C with two... Two pretty storied uh, franchises in their own right. That is Fnatic from the uh, European side and Koreans, Korea's Gen G. Uh, both of those teams also quite formidable uh, in this year's event. I expect them to not really have a lot of trouble either. Now, Fnatic in particular um, placed very well. This year, we were looking at uh, second place finishes in the spring playoffs and the summer playoffs, which is how they qualified uh, for this. They were second overall in the spring split, fourth overall in the LEC summer split. Um, they have never won the world's the world tournament, but they came in second in 2018, so they're ready to get back and look at that again. Um, having placed fifth through eighth in 2017 and 5th through 8th in 2019 as well. So they seem to go back and forth. They're either runner-up or they're 5th through 8th, runner-up, 5th through 8th. Hoping this year, they're hoping this year can change for them. Team Solo Mid, on the other hand, not quite as uh, prolific in their results at Worlds. Uh, they have, they did win the um, LCS Summer Playoffs, beating FlyQuest three games to two, which is how they earned this number one spot. Um, they have not, however, won a Worlds event despite qualifying so many times. In fact, they have never placed higher than third, and that was all the way back in 2017. Uh, I'm sorry, in 2011, World Season 1. I had my lines mixed up there. World Season 1, they placed third uh, overall and have not gotten back to that since. A 5th through 8 in 2014 and 2012, 14 to 16 in 2015. They really they really have had some trouble uh, getting back to those lofty places that they were. And this team runs on a core of two players, one of whom who has been with the team since all the way back in 2013, his name is Bjergsen, uh, his full name being Soren Bjerg. I hope I'm saying that right. He is the mid laner. He handles the mid lane, uh, the middle lane on the map. Uh, and double lift, uh, Peter Peng, his name is, he is a bottom laner. These two, these two players played together for a very, very long time, built up a major rapport with one another, and then double lift left for another team, leaving Bjergsen behind on Team Solo Mid. However, this past year, the gang got back together as of April of 2020, uh, immediately ascended to first overall in North America, and they are ready to make a big-time splash in this year's Worlds. The rest of the team uh, is a German player, by the name, uh, his name is Broken Blade, um, a Chinese player named uh, Spika, uh, Bjergsen, as I said, double S, as I said, Biofrost, who is Canadian, and a Swedish player named Treats. Uh, those are the six teams in Team Solo Mid, the names you will be hearing if you watch their matches. Now, if I'm looking at Team Solo Mid's group, uh, it will depend on who comes out of the play-in. But I do think that they have a chance to be in the top two of their group and get out and take a, uh, and take a stab at the knockout stage. I really do think they have a decent shot here. Gen G and Fnatic are both very good, but uh, I don't I don't see really uh, they can stack up to anyone. But that Bjergsen and Double Lift uh, duo can really match up to anyone as far as the research I'm doing is concerned. Now I am still I'm very new to League of Legends. I'm sort of talking out of the side of my mouth here, but I have this feeling uh, that of the three teams from North America uh, that are in Worlds 2020, I definitely think that Team Solo Mid could make the biggest splash. 
So that is a team to focus on when the main event starts um, in October. Now, for now, though, um, Team Liquid is up first. The play-in match is starting on the 25th, and then FlyQuest and Solo Mid will eventually get to play in the main event. Those are the three teams that you should be cheering on as a North American League viewer. Um, Learn about them more. uh, Check them out. Check out all the other teams that they sponsor, all the other games that they sponsor, and you may find yourself a new fan of TSM or FlyQuest or Team Liquid. And um, all there is left to do now is watch for when Worlds 2020 begins uh, over on LOL, League of Legends, lolesports.com. Um, hope you enjoy the matchups. We'll t- I'm sure we'll talk again next week about some results and uh, who is moving on and who is going home. But for now, it's time to get out your glasses because there are two big-time games waiting for you this week at the stores. Let's take a look at what's on tap. First off this week, we have Mafia Definitive Edition, a uh, complete remake of the 2002 PlayStation 2 cult classic Mafia, which spawned two sequels, uh, one on the PlayStation 3 and one on the PlayStation 4. Uh, PlayStation 4. Uh, Mafia brings the original story of the City of Lost Heaven back in a brand new light with brand new visuals. Um, new action, new suspense, new all of that. Definitely one to look into if you're a fan of Mafia movies or Mafia games. And then Super Mario 35 launches on October 1st. Super Mario 35 being the 30th anniversary, 35th anniversary celebration of Mario, where 35 players enter a match. The first one to complete as many stages in a Super Mario run wins, all while be having extra obstacles thrown at you throughout the playthrough. Two very different styles on tap this week, but each will quench a specific thirst, and for some, both might quench that thirst. But, what's on tap for you? There you have it, that is what you can look forward to playing brand new this week. A slow week, uh, for sure, Uh, with uh, only two games coming out this week. These last couple weeks have been mostly about uh, console pre-orders and things of the like, not so much the brand new titles coming out. Uh, We'll not be able to say the same next week uh, with two heavy hitters coming on Friday, October the 2nd, uh, in the form of Crash Bandicoot 4, It's About Time, and Star Wars Squadrons, but we will talk about that next week. Now we are going to talk about the biggest gaming news of the week, and it happened right on Monday morning. Did not give us a chance to even wake up and get our Monday morning coffee gaming industry, you sent us right into the breach with the news that Microsoft, creators of Xbox, of Halo, and of countless other things, have acquired, purchased, uh, one of the largest third-party publishers in the industry, Bethesda, for $7.5 billion dollars um it it really it came as a surprise to everybody and everyone uh the press release that was issued to um press confirmed that they did purchase all of zenimax media which owns bethesda for 7.5 billion which gives them ownership of the following franchises uh the elder scrolls which includes morrowind oblivion and skyrim uh Fallout, all the Fallout games, uh, Elder Scrolls Online, um, Doom, which is made by id Software, who is owned by Bethesda, Wolfenstein, uh, the classic shooter, also made by Bethesda's, one of Bethesda Studios' machine games, um, all of their brand new titles coming out, Deathloop uh, and Ghostwire Tokyo among them, and we'll get to an interesting caveat with those two in just a second, um, really took everybody by surprise. Uh, on Monday morning, it really did. I went from tired and hazy at about 8.55 to wow, the world is changing at 9.05. Um, Microsoft t- is telling people uh, that the primary goal of this was for um, cloud-based services like Xbox Game Pass, according to a Game Informer article that I have right here. Xbox Game Pass just celebrated another major milestone with 15 million members subscribed. Uh, and if you if you own an Xbox and you're not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? 
Uh, the system is just gangbusters. Uh, the free games that you get every month and all the things they keep adding to it. Now this Bethesda portfolio will be added to it as well. Um, and the CEO of Microsoft said in the press release himself, his quote is, gaming is the most expansive category in the entertainment industry. Quality differentiated content is the engine and growth behind the growth and value of Xbox Game Pass. Bethesda has seen success across every category of games, and together we were further ambition to empower the more than 3 billion gamers worldwide. Now, as you can imagine, this set the ever-going Xbox versus PlayStation console war, which, quick aside, is the stupidest thing on earth, but I digress, aflame with Xbox claiming victory and PlayStation wondering if they would ever be able to play Fallout and the Elder Scrolls on their console ever again. And to be honest, those details are not completely set in stone right now. Uh, There are thoughts, there are um, opinion pieces that have gone out, there are people wondering just to what extent Uh, Bethesda will become Xbox exclusive, and everyone seems, the general consensus seems to be that they will sort of be there, uh, that some IP from Bethesda may stay Xbox exclusive, where the main titles, the big ones, the Fallouts, the Elder Scrolls, the Dooms, will continue to be cross-platform. That actually brings up uh, Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo that I mentioned earlier, Deathloop from Arcane Studios, which made Dishonored, and um, Ghostwire Tokyo from Tango Gameworks, which previously made, um, I believe, The Evil Within was their last uh, big title. Could be wrong on that, though. Um, Those two games actually signed exclusivity deals to come out on PlayStation 5 first. Uh, And it sounds like those two will not, those deals will not be affected. Meaning that games technically owned by Microsoft will come out on PlayStation first. That is the strange world that video gamers are living in right now. So people have commented on it. First it came out that uh, after this acquisition, Bethesda games will be on other platforms on a case-by-case basis. That's what started all the speculation that I spoke about earlier. When will they come out on Sony platforms? When will they stay Xbox? Will Nintendo ever see a Bethesda game ever again? Skyrim actually does moderately well on the Switch, as does uh, Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal, if it ever comes out. So that's where that started there, and then uh, VP of uh, Bethesda, Pete Hines, Uncle Pete, uh, to those who in the gaming industry who have seen him on stage at Bethesda's E3 briefings, um, also put out his own blog talking about how Microsoft was the right fit um, and how the industry changed, and it brings up a lot of questions, but the key point is, and this is his quote, we're still Bethesda, we're still working on the same games we were yesterday, made by the same studios we worked for for year, worked with for years, and those games will be published by us. And according to Heinz also, on the Bethesda side, the big change coming out of the acquisition, the thing that made it the right move for them, was it allowed them to make even better games going forward, and this is a direct quote again, Microsoft is an incredible partner and offers access to resources that will make us a better publisher and developer. We believe that means better games for you to play. Simply put, we believe that change is an important part of getting better. We believe in pushing ourselves to be better, to innovate, and to grow. And on that, uh, one of Bethesda's biggest criticisms in all of their games is that the engine they've been using uh, for the longest time, since probably Oblivion uh, on the Xbox 360, hasn't really seen a major overhaul. It's seen moderate changes, moderate updates, but nothing really substantial. However, Todd Howard, uh, head of ZeniMax Studios, one of the big guys, big developers at Bethesda, and the father of modern Fallout and Elder Scrolls, came out himself and teased uh, what he's calling the largest engine overhaul since Oblivion, for the next generation of consoles, and here is his quote. With each new console cycle, we've evolved together from bringing, uh, we being Xbox in this case, 
from bringing mods to consoles with Fallout 4 and Xbox One, which are now over a billion downloads by themselves, to the latest technologies fueling Xbox Series X and S. These new systems are optimized for the vast worlds we love to create, with generational leaps not just in graphics, but CPU and data streaming as well. It's led to our largest engine overhaul since Oblivion, with all new technologies powering our first new IP in 25 years in Starfield, and the Elder Scrolls VI, which all we know about those two are their logos as they were revealed at E3 2018. So that's what the official people are saying. The change is good. Uh, it will allow them to make better games. Their systems will be overhauled. And Microsoft's like, we're going to make them a big part of our Game Pass portfolio. And that's that. But, as IGN review editor Dan Stapleton pointed out on his Twitter, Xbox did not buy these games. You don't ha- I mean, Xbox doesn't have to buy Bethesda to make them a big part of Game Pass or to help them innovate uh, with their systems. They can, they can sponsor them. They can cut a deal or they're big on Game Pass if Xbox supplies some resources to their development. There are other ways to go about this. You only buy the studio, buy the publisher, and make it part of your portfolio if you are going to make things exclusive. It really does give them an interesting ace in the hole having these new studios. But this whole case-by-case basis thing, I think, is going to become very limited case-by-case very quickly. And if I'm being completely honest here, and again, I, I don't have the full knowledge on this. I'm just kind of talking on my gut instinct here. I think Starfield, that new IP that Todd Howard mentioned, is going to be the first one to be completely Xbox exclusive. Starfield will be an Xbox exclusive. Um, you're, I'm predicting that right here, right now, uh, five days after the sale actually happened. Uh, I really do think that Starfield, all we know is a logo, and that it's set in space, Uh, will become an Xbox Series X exclusive. I do not think that that's going to happen with the Elder Scrolls VI, because that is much too large of a franchise for Xbox not to want to make the most amount of money for it. Will it be on Game Pass Day 1? Absolutely. Will it sell Buku bucks uh, on the Xbox? Of course it will, because it'll be optimized for that console. Does that mean it won't run well on the PS5? No, absolutely not. But it'll be one of those things where Bethesda is associated with Xbox. So people like me, who have both consoles, will choose to play it on Xbox just because you associate that franchise with that console. The same way some people uh, associate fighting games like Street Fighter with PlayStation. PlayStation doesn't own Capcom. But Street Fighter V was exclusive to PlayStation 4. So people will now associate Street Fighter with PlayStation. It's the same same sort of concept, uh, if you're asking me. But more interestingly, perhaps, not so much the future of Bethesda games and their exclusivity with Xbox. That is a cool topic. But more interesting to me is who's next. Because there was a a prevailing theory that has since died down in the days after this acquisition was announced, that it may be the first one, and that we might see a rash of acquisitions and purchases from now until the consoles come out or whatever. Microsoft, for three days, was rumored to be buying Sega, and the the, the, the threads being connected to make that a a thing from the new Xbox uh, One controller having Sonic's colors, blue in the front, white in the back, to a woman making a pose in front of a bunch of Sonic games where her hands were were crossed in an X for some reason. It's just a lot of different weird things. People thought Microsoft was going to announce that they bought Sega. It did not happen. Um, I don't think Microsoft is done, but I don't think Microsoft's next purchase is anytime soon. $7.5 billion 
while it might be you know an astronomical number to us it's it's not a it's not a drip in the bucket but it's still not you know a, a ton of money for them they've purchased other things for more money i saw a graphic they purchased linkedin for like 26.8 million dollars so they have they have a billion dollars excuse me they have capital but i don't think they're going to be making a big splash purchase like this anytime soon also and this is just me i'm kind of glad they didn't buy sega because personally if you're asking me i would prefer nintendo to buy sega just because that would be the funniest piece of information i could hear uh in a <laughs> in a long time that nintendo bought finally bought their biggest rival for years in sega and now mario and sonic are under the same umbrella that to me would just be perfect um, but if we're talking about who's next, who's actually next, I'm not saying Nintendo's buying Sega. I'm not saying that at all. If we're talking about who is actually next to be purchased, there's one studio that I think uh, would be next on the block. And it's not a massive studio like Bethesda is. Uh, it's not going to create the same ripple effect uh, as that sale did. But I still think it's one that's important. And that is Blue Point Games being uh, purchased by Sony for PlayStation 5 exclusivity. Blue Point has now done multiple remakes of classic PlayStation games. Shadow of the Colossus, they remade. Uh, they're remaking Dark Souls as a PS5 uh, launch title. Uh, there are a few other games that they have done in their history uh to re- remake and remaster, not just for Sony. They've worked for a lot of different uh, companies in their time. Uh, so if we look at a list here of some of the things, they did the Metal Gear Solid HD collection uh, when that was released in 2011 on Xbox 360 uh, and PlayStation 3. They did uh, the Nathan Drake collection, Uncharted, in 2015. They remastered Gravity Rush, which was a PSP game for the PlayStation 4. Um uh, they've done a lot of remastering. All, almost all of their games, uh, with the exception of their first ever game, Blast Factor on PlayStation 3, uh, have been remakes or remasters of games. God of War Collection was first in 2009, and then the list goes on from there. That, to me, tells me that they are a perfect fit for Sony's portfolio, and all they have to do from here on out is just churn out uh, remakes and remasters the way that they do. If Demon Souls is any indication, they know what the heck they're doing. Uh, so that would be an acquisition I would want. And I would also, to kind of partner with that, I would want Sony to approach Konami about purchasing their game library uh, and bringing them in. Could you imagine having Bluepoint there for remaking or remastering games? And Konami's library, Castlevania, Metal Gear Solid, uh, Silent Hill, so on and so forth, that they could remake. And then you could give any of those franchises to any of Sony's existing uh, studios and make brand new games. I would love a Castlevania game made by Sony Santa Monica, who just made God of War. They're also making God of War 2. They're very busy. But that style, that's that's Sony Santa Monica style, getting Castlevania would be awesome. So if, 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 if I were running Sony, if I were talking about Sony right now, I would talk about bringing Bluepoint in, and I would talk about bringing in Konami. Because those two things together would make for a whole well of remakes, remasters, and possibilities that are virtually endless. As it is, we're already hearing that Metal Gear Solid, the original on PlayStation, may be getting remade soon, and that makes me very happy, happy. I don't think it's going to happen, but a guy can dream. Uh, but that's what's happening right now. People are starting to think, who's going to buy who? Who's on the block? Um, From Software, who makes Dark Souls, was a uh, rumored studio to be being purchased soon. Capcom, who makes Street Fighter, was rumored to be on the selling block. It's a, it's a, it became the wild, wild west all of a sudden, but I don't think anything else is going to happen. I think this is one of those wild west towns where it looks like a bunch of crazy stuff's happened, a bunch of crazy stuff happened a little while ago, but now it's all tumbleweeds, 
and and gentle breezes. Uh, I think I think it's going to die down until the consoles come out, and then we'll start talking about potential acquisitions again. Um, but congratulations to Microsoft and Bethesda. Certainly made quite the uh, the ruckus uh, when they that purchase was announced. I am looking forward to seeing what they do with this portfolio now, because all it's going to do is make things more interesting in the console competition. And when the competition is good, we the gamers are the ones who ultimately benefit from it by having better games, better experiences at our disposal. And that's how I feel about that. However, we are not done yet. We have one more thing to talk about before we adjourn today. And... Do you smell that? Yes, folks, it is time once again for Hot Off the Grill, the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast review segment where we take a game that has recently launched and we talk about all of the good things, the bad things, the ugly things, and the great things about that particular release. Give it a nice score at the end to make it official, and I officially recommend that game or don't recommend that game to you for your gaming future. Today we are talking about... The big one, the big guy himself, Super Mario, specifically Super Mario 3D All-Stars, the recent compilation of Mario titles released for the Nintendo Switch uh, last Friday of the 18th, consisting of Super Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine, and Super Mario Galaxy. Now, the first thing right off the bat about this game is, as far as remastered compilations go... And I will be the first to admit this. It's a little lazy. It's a little lazy. Uh, and by that I mean the presentation is a little... I feel like there could be more done. It just kind of... When you first turn it on, you see a brief like, 15 second video of Mario grabbing stars or shines. It shows all three of them at the same time. It says Super Mario 3D All-Stars. And then you can choose between... The three games or their soundtracks, you go in to the game that you picked, and you're in. There's no, I don't know, there's no pump. There's no circumstance. There's no, it's 35 years of Mario, and you're celebrating it with three quintessential Mario games. Well, two quintessential Mario games and Mario Sunshine. Uh, No offense to Mario Sunshine, it's just not, it doesn't compare to the other two um, in my eyes. But we'll get to that. Uh, it, but it, but other than having the soundtracks on there, it just it's just like yeah, here it is. Here's the compilation. Here's where you choose what you're going to do. Uh, have fun. Uh, so it it definitely reeks when you first turn the game on of cash grab. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, getting into the games themselves, though, uh, they all for me play as close to the originals as they possibly could with some noted improvements and some noted detriments. Uh, First, Super Mario 64, an absolute classic, one of the first games I ever 100% completed. Uh, 120 stars back on the Nintendo 64, one of my crowning gaming achievements as a 9-year-old or a 10-year-old when that game first came out, uh, when I first received it. Uh, This version plays very loyally to that original Nintendo 64 version, um, to its detriment uh, a little bit. The camera is unruly. The camera was always unruly, but the camera here is very, very unruly. This uh, Super Mario 64, not unlike uh, the other very successful Nintendo 64 game in The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, has not aged perfectly. Um... I would say that Mario 64 has aged better than Ocarina of Time. Uh, I definitely hold that uh, opinion, especially now with Breath of the Wild being out. Uh, Breath of the Wild does more to improve Zelda from the Ocarina of Time formula than Odyssey does to improve on the formula established here 
at Super Mario 64. To me, they're both wonderful games, uh, but Breath of the Wild is much more of a revolution for that franchise uh, than Odyssey was for Super Mario. Uh, Super Mario still Odyssey even still very much holds to the foundations established here in Super Mario 64, um, collecting stars, but in that case, moons, going to different worlds, completing all these different challenges. Uh, but Mario 64, uh, the trendsetter, the foundation layer as it is, does have its lumps. The camera is a big one. The um, lack of direction when you're doing certain jumps is a big one. Some of the challenges are pretty difficult. But the game itself is very, very, very loyal to that original Nintendo 64 experience. Very well done. Um, very happy with it, uh, this particular port. Would I have preferred uh, a more full-on remake, not unlike um, the Mafia remake that's coming out tomorrow, or the other like Final Fantasy VII remake, something that crazy, where it completely redid all of Super Mario 64? Yeah! I mean, that's a good idea. It's pretty cool. I don't think it's going to happen, now that uh, Mario's 35th anniversary plans have been revealed. But at the same time, that would be pretty cool uh, to see something like that. Uh, this this isn't it. This is more the Nintendo 64 version with ups, upscaled graphics. Uh, but And that's basically it. Like, there you go. Same exact game. And for a lot of people, it will be... It'll have its warts. Uh, some of which are harder to overcome than others. That camera being a big one. But I think it's a loyal port of one of my favorite games of all time. Um, and I definitely uh, am pr- I'm happy with how that turned out. Second one is Super Mario Sunshine. Uh, same thing. One of uh, one of the, my favorite GameCube games. Not my favorite Mario. Uh, we'll get to that one. Um, but more derivative and more uh, less of a, of a jump uh, between 64 and Sunshine than, let's say, Sunshine and Mario Galaxy, which, again, we'll get to. Uh, this one for me is the weakest of the three ports, not because it's also the weakest of the three games. Again, that's my opinion, uh, but just because something about this port doesn't work the way it should. I like it. it the, the I don't know if it's the buttons being unresponsive or the controller I'm using not syncing properly or what, but I only experience it in Sunshine. 64 and Galaxy are fine. But I feel like every time I press the jump button to jump, and I'm using a Switch Pro controller, which looks like a standard Xbox or PlayStation controller, not the Joy-Cons. Um, I feel like whenever I press the, the jump button, there's an extra maybe half a second to three quarters of a second where Mario does nothing before he actually jumps. It's minuscule, but it's noticeable. And when you're having to do these highly precise platforming uh, sections in Mario Sunshine, particularly those where you lose the water pack on your back and it's just straight up jumping and uh, more classic Mario oriented, having that extra delay is not good because you're timing your jump at the edge of a platform to reach the next platform You can't have that delay where Mario is just going to walk right off the edge. I find, and acclimating to that delay is, I think, tougher than the original timing of the jump. Because you already have the timing down, now your your, your controls are acting funky, and you're not landing the jump as you should. That, to me, is a huge, huge deal. That, that, even if it's so infantile and so small of 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 a delay makes all the impact in the world. Spoken like a true fighting game fan, I know. But it it is noticeable to the point where it makes Sunshine frustrating. And in a port that's supposed to be celebrating these three monumental games in Super Mario's uh, portfolio, frustrating is not what you want. So uh, I do say to be warned when you open up the Super Mario Sunshine port for the first time, See if you notice that same delay in jumping that I do, or if that's just something that's affecting me. Um, I thought found it to be very noticeable to the point where it was hampering my ability to actually play the game. Um, but again, I hope it doesn't happen to you. I hope you can just enjoy it uh, to the full extent that you're supposed to enjoy it, and uh, that's that. But the third one, Super Mario Galaxy. Oh, boy. Super Mario Galaxy's port 
in this Nintendo, uh, in this 3D All Stars, is just gangbusters. It's the cream of the crop. It's the best. It's my favorite Mario game of all time, and I don't think it'll ever be topped. It, it's and it's it's brought over to the Switch so magnificently. Uh, the controls are there and they're precise. Uh, being able to aim with the Pro Controller to pick up the star bits, just as I did with the Wii Remote back in 2007 when it first came out, is spot on. Being able to press R and recenter the target, just like I did press B on that Wii Remote back in the day, is genius. Everything about the Super Mario Galaxy port is perfect. It's the best part of this compilation. It's the best Mario game ever made, in my opinion. And it shows. Everything is here. All of the the different galaxies, all the different challenges, the music, the characters, the lore. It's just wonderful. And it, I would have taken this remaster for $40 by itself. I, I, I don't necessarily need... Mario 64 and Sunshine. Man, they're, they're fun games uh, with with their frustrations, but I would have gladly purchased this Galaxy 1 um, remaster by itself. It's just so well done. It's so good. Uh, maybe the reason is the technology between the Wii and the Switch is more compatible to be remastered than the GameCube and the 64. I understand that. Um why I think 64 would have benefited more from a full-on remake as opposed to the remastering that it got. Uh, And Sunshine just needs to lose the delay, and it's a fine game. Uh, But Galaxy, man, Galaxy is is just perfect in every way. It's the best part of this thing. And if you do purchase it, if you do go 3D All-Stars, try your best to save Galaxy for last. You will not regret it. Um... But as far as the full Super Mario 3D All-Stars package, uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, I rate Super Mario 3D All-Stars a 7.5. And And I call it a a 7.5 because two-thirds of the package have noticeable issues even that, that keep it from being the top of the of the the cream of the crop, top of the line. Uh, compilation that they want it to be despite the fact that the third section is Super Mario Perfection. Uh, The the detriments of 64, which is just aged, and Sunshine, which has that weird delay, do bring the entire package down a little bit, to the point where it makes me say I would have taken Galaxy by itself um, and been very happy to do so. Um, However, I do recommend it. It is a it is a fun compilation. Despite the flaws of the older games, they are still fun, and they are still completely intact. Uh, all Everything that you found in those original versions is here and waiting for you. Um, I do recommend it to Mario fans. I recommend it to uh, Nintendo fans. I recommend it to parents of children. Uh, my, my child is enjoying watching Mario and playing every once in a while. I'm not going to lie. Um... So I, I know that it works on at least a four-year-old. I'm sure it'll work on your child, too. Uh, if they're getting a Switch for the holidays, if they are getting the if they have a Switch and you need something to add to it, uh, I, do, I recommend this wholeheartedly uh, for that purpose. But the hardcore fans will find um, some little flaws here and there in two-thirds of the package, and that's what brings the score down to the official Hot Off the Grill score of 7.5 out of 10, for Super Mario 3D All-Stars. And with that, we have reached the finale of episode number 15 of the Cheesesteaks and Controllers podcast. Uh, Quick update on Extra Life. We are still sitting at $365 raised for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The goal of $1,226 is still in play. Uh, I am still willing to put on that hat and uh, scare the crap out of myself for charity for at least an hour. If it means that Chop is getting the most I've ever raised by myself for this campaign, uh, the URL to donate to my cause will be in the information 
on this podcast on iHeartRadio, and I will say it here, though it is a little uh, confusing. It is extra-life.org. That's extra life, extra dash life dot org slash participant slash date Jason dash Finelli. And that's how you get to my page and you can donate one dollar, you could donate a hundred dollars, you could donate anything in between. Whatever you can spare for these kids would be very much appreciated. Uh there's a wonderful cause playing video games for twenty four hours to support Children's Miracle Network. Uh, I say it's Children's Hospital Philadelphia specifically because I am allowed to designate which hospital the money I raise goes to. And of course, I'm going to choose CHOP because it's basically in my backyard. So uh, I've done it. This is my seventh year doing it. It took a couple of years off to uh, you know have kids and get into that groove and everything. But I'm coming back with a vengeance this year uh, on November the 7th, Saturday, November 7th, first Saturday in November. I will be playing games 24 hours, streaming uh, at twitch.tv slash jfan64 as much as I can. Um, I'll have a schedule out at some point of what I'm going to be playing and when. Uh, perhaps I'll let some donations dictate what I'm going to play. And, as I said, if we get to 1226, I will don the VR headset and jump into Resident Evil 7 for at least one hour, uh, putting myself in harm's way, not harm's way, in horror's way, uh, for the kids. And really, that's the only reason I do it is for the kids of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. So with that, this has been episode 15 of the Cheesesteaks and Controllers podcast. My name is Jason Finelli, the esports and gaming insider for Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM Philadelphia, 1480 AM Philadelphia, and I Heart Radio. Make sure you listen to the Rodney McLeod Show. Uh, defensive player for the Eagles, Rodney McLeod, is on every Tuesday from 6 to 7 live from Chickies and Pete's in Philadelphia also on Fox PHL The Gambler, great uh, insight from the player right after the game is over or the week, couple days after the, each game is over uh, so definitely listen to that and um, always listen to the Daily Ticket with Sean Brace, 3 to 6 every Monday through Friday uh, for the latest and greatest news in the world of sports including me, every Thursday at 4 o'clock talking esports and video games Thank you so much for your time and your ears. I will talk to you next week. Goodbye.